listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 16, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atypical infections and asthma. Our presenter is Dr. Prescott Atkinson. He's a professor and director of pediatric allergy, asthma, and immunology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Good morning. I, I want to first thank uh, Dr. Atkinson for being a brave soul to um, come on COLA. Um, for someone who hasn't done it before, um, he um, was willing to try. A lot of people um, are a little uh, concerned about how this whole process works. Hopefully um, it will be um, relatively easy and we'll get you to um, give us another talk sometime in the future. Um, this morning for our second talk, um, uh, Dr. Atkinson going to talk on atypical infections and asthma. I've known Dr. Atkinson for a, for a long time. He and I are both po program directors. He's in charge of the allergy immunology training program at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, he has a, a marked interest in immunology and also in um, um, atypical infections and asthma, and he was willing this morning to talk to us. And um, I want to welcome uh, Prescott, and uh, thank you very much for doing this. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Atkinson. I can give you control of the keyboard and mouse. And then okay, all right. Mike, you can then control it, and it uh, should be all yours now. All right, well, very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul and Jay, for the invitation. I, th I do find this uh, program very user-friendly. I'm, I'm quite impressed, and I really enjoyed uh, what I heard of the last, last talk. It sounded uh, very interesting indeed. Um, I'm going to be a little more focused in my presentation than the last one, which uh, looked uh, more like an overview uh, of a lot of different dermatologic conditions. Um, I'm going to be talking about atypical infections and asthma and pretty much focusing on one organism, as you uh, may be able to guess from the topic uh, title. I'm really going to be talking about mostly mycoplasma pneumonia and evidence to uh, suggest that it may have a role in pathogenesis and also its role, uh, its uh, Clearly, clearly has a role in uh, acute exacerbations of asthma and uh, uh, issues in uh, diagnosis and treatment. Let's see if I can change. Okay. Before I get started uh, talking about the organism and, and atypical infections, and by the way, the atypical infection, when we talk about atypical bacterial uh, pneumonias, we're usually talking about three organisms, mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, chlamydia, or what is now called chlamydophila pneumonia, and uh, Legionella. And uh, Chlamydophila pneumonia and Mycoplasma pneumonia may have a rather similar phenotype in terms of uh, producing exacerbations. They're, they're clearly organisms that are designed for chronic or at least long-term long infections, uh, pretty much limited to humans. Legionella may be more of an acute infection, and uh, although it can look rather similar as a, as a different, different type of uh, organism. But I'm not going to really talk about either of those other two organisms. I don't really uh, specialize in, in them. And uh, as far as chlamydia or chlamydophila pneumonia, though, it could be viewed as a rather similar, and, and uh, studies have shown that it also plays a rather, uh, seems to play a rather similar role in, um, in uh, exacerbations of asthma and, and, and so forth. So before I, before I get started, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the airway microbiome, uh, some emerging information uh, with the new newer uh, uh, chip. Uh, chips that are being used to look at, at microbial populations in different areas uh, of the human body as well as in uh, various uh, aspects of uh, our uh, natural surroundings. It's uh, very powerful uh, techniques that are just beginning to open up this, uh, this area. The, the data are very preliminary and, and not necessarily uh, very clear as far as their implications yet, but they're very interesting. I thought I'd just touch on a couple of recent publications and then focus on mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, some evidence related to acute exacerbations and a role in chronic asthma, uh, problems in diagnosis and treatment, uh, some uh, information related to what's known about virulence factors for this organism, particularly how it may activate immunologic cells, uh, a newly described toxin, which is related to pertussis toxin, uh, animal models of infection that support uh, a, uh, a role in uh, chronic infection and airway hyperreactivity, 
and finally, uh, an issue that could become a big problem uh, in the near future in the U.S., uh, emerging macrolide resistance in this organism. So first, uh, I want to talk about a couple of papers that have come out recently, this one in 2010 by Hilti and colleagues, uh, uh, in which they looked at microbial populations in, uh, in COPD, asthma, and, uh, and normal individuals, uh, both in adults and children. Uh, and uh, they looked at the 16S ribosomal RNA uh, using PCR uh, and sequenced about 1,000 clones for each individual in each group. And they came up with uh, uh, the observation that there appears to be a normal flora in the upper airway, or in, in all of the airways, uh, and the lower airway uh, is rather similar to the upper GI tract, with maybe about 2,000 bacterial genomes per square centimeter of airway. And, uh, and the populations appear to differ in asthma and COPD, uh, with, all, with uh, the asthmatics and COPD patients tending to have uh, higher diversity and higher numbers. Uh, and there's a, a, a prevalence of gram-negative, such as hemophilus, in patients with asthma and COPD as well. And uh, gram-negative anaerobes, which are difficult to culture, like Prevotella, uh, which may have been uh, under, uh, under-recognized uh, in the past uh, as being uh, prevalent in, uh, in normal airways. And Dr. Atkinson, that, that, that's kind of amazing information to me. I was always raised with the idea that the uh, airways were sterile, that they didn't have a lot of bacteria in them, and now we found out that there, there actually is a flora? That's, that appears to be true. And I, as I say, this information is, uh, is it's, it's using techniques that are opening windows that we haven't really looked in very well before. And it's clear that a lot of the organism, or it appears likely that a lot of the organisms that are being detected may be just passing through. They may be organisms that were inhaled uh, and are being cleared by the airway, but some of them are likely uh, actually resident and proliferating there. And that all that information is, I think, uh, what's going to need further study uh, in the future. But it does appear that the airways are not uh, as sterile as we were led to believe. And I'll, I'll uh, show you what I mean here. So this is the, uh, this is the really interesting uh, uh, graph of the, uh, showing the diversity of different organisms that are there. And the, and the interesting thing is that in the controls, the orange and yellow rings are the uh, the proteobacteria are gram negatives like Haemophilus, and you can see that those rings are much larger in the COPD and asthma patients. Um, and similarly, the gram, uh, the uh, 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 Bacteroides uh, type uh, anaerobe, uh, uh, such as Prevotella, shown in, in uh, purple, uh, lavender, are uh, expanded in uh, in the normals in the inner ring as well. So there's there's a very uh, different. Uh, or uh, there appear to be significant differences in the in the flavor of different bacteria that are that are being obtained uh, through these through these techniques. So um, the second paper was a paper that came out in the JACI earlier this year, and it uh, was a paper by Huang et al. and they used samples that were obtained from an earlier multi-institutional uh, study published uh, also <clears throat> I think in the JACI in uh, the fall of 2010 by Sutherland et al. And uh, they used, uh, they looked at bronchial brushings, and they used microarray as well as parallel clone uh, sequencing analysis from 65 uh, uh, asthmatics and 10 controls. And they found a uh, what appears to be a substantially higher microbial diversity in the asthmatics, and this seemed to correlate with airway hyperresponsiveness and also response to antibiotic uh, therapy. So these were, stud these were uh, observations that were not published in the original study, and this study was not designed for this purpose, but they're utilizing samples that were obtained uh, in this study and then reanalyzing them. This is, the, this is a, a little cladogram showing the incredible diversity of bacteria that they're detecting in the airways. And I think it's probably highly likely that many of these are just, uh, they're just, uh, present but not actually replicating their things that the person has inhaled. We know that airways in asthmatics and COPD patients have more uh, um, mucus and that the uh, ciliary clearance may not be very good. This may be kind of a reflection of the, of the possibility that the airways are just dirtier there. There are more bacterial products, but not necessarily uh, 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 telling us that, that the airways are, are, that there are actually all these organisms growing there. I don't 
I don't think that's likely to turn out to be true. But one thing, and this, this shows diverse, this shows the amount of bacterial products that could be expanded using PCR in 47 asthmatics compared to five controls, and a pretty significant looking difference there. And again, just telling you that the airways in a lot of asthmatics appear to be dirtier than, uh, than in control individuals. The numbers of controls are relatively small analyzed here. And then finally, because this was, this original study was a treatment trial, they did have information related to patient responses um, and uh, to uh, a trial of clarithromycin. And uh, it, although again the numbers here are pretty small, it did appear that patients with higher di bacterial diversity did exhibit a, uh, a response to clarithromycin treatment compared to uh, patients with lower uh, bacterial diversity in the airway. So uh, the summary that you could say from these still rather preliminary studies that, need, that, that are rather similar to each other but need to definitely need more, um, more, and, uh, uh, more studies to replicate them and ex expand their findings seem to imply that normal, there is a normal airway flora, that there are bacteria that are commonly present there. They may not be easily culturable, um, but that that uh, normal flora may be deranged in people with asthma and COPD. Um, there appears to be higher bacterial diversity in many patients with asthma and COPD. Some of those may just be, as I mentioned, they may just be contaminating the airways in people who don't have very good uh, mucociliary clearance and have increased mucus in the airways. Uh, and, but uh, there does appear, at least in a subset of patients, to be a correlation of uh, uh, improvement uh, with antibiotic treatment and a correlation with airway hyperreactivity. It's a complicated uh, uh, um, subject, and I think the data are still preliminary, but they're intriguing and do suggest that there is a, uh, or that just as uh, airway uh, allergic disease uh, clearly uh, uh, has a role in, uh, 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 in asthma pathogenesis, that bacterial products and actual bacterial flora may also have a have a role as well, and that sort of takes us into the into the topic related to the, the main subject that I wanted to talk about today, which was mycoplasma pneumoniae, for which we have a, a fair amount of data, but still uh, still waiting for um, more conclusive information. So asthma, as a, as everyone here doesn't need reminding, it's a chronic inflammatory disease. The, the, uh, the essential characteristic is that it's reversible, uh, that it uh, res results in airway hyperreactivity that is, uh, that is uh, at least to some degree reversible. Um, you could ask the question, is, is asthma today the same disease that, uh, that uh, physicians were treating early in the 20th century? Our predecessors didn't seem to have a very high opinion of asthma as far as a severe disease. Um, Sir William Osler said that the asthmatic pants into old age. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a, uh, a, uh, an asthmatic himself, said that it was a slight ailment that prolongs longevity. Of course, at that time, uh, physicians were, were struggling with a whole variety of much more severe infectious diseases in, in, uh, in, the, in Western countries, and those have been at least temporarily tamed uh, with the advent of antibiotics. So it may be all a matter of uh, all a matter of degree. However, uh, we know that asthma today is a big problem, very expensive problem, affecting over 24 million people in the United States, uh, disproportionately higher in certain ethnic groups and in uh, certain uh, socioeconomic groups, and is a substantial cause of mortality every year. Uh, these people are not wheezing into old age. There, there are people who are dying from a, a acute. Uh, asthma attacks uh, across the country. So it, it is a big problem, um, and there may be, uh, uh, what we'll look at now is the possibility that some of this problem may be related to infection, or at least to bacterial products. Um, asthma pathogenesis, there are many, many different, uh, different aspects, of course, in the literature. There's a clear genetic predisposition, uh, which we've known about for a long time. And uh, genetic studies have revealed a number of genetic loci uh, and some genetic, uh, some gene polymorphisms. And many of these appear to be things that should be related to host defense and inflammation. Um, among uh, environmental influences, we know that allergen exposure is very important. A majority of childhood asthmatics are 
uh, have airway allergies, um, irritants such as diesel exhaust, tobacco smoke, other pollutants have a have also have a have a proven role. And infection and microbial products are probably also important. There's a lot of information, uh, particularly from the group at uh, in Wisconsin uh, on viral infections in early childhood. The hygiene hypothesis, which shows uh, which seems to show that bacterial products, uh, exposure to bacterial products can actually have a protective role. And then uh, the role uh, still unclear, but, uh, but uh, um, I hope to show a little later in this uh, presentation that, that stronger data showing that atypical uh, bacteria such as mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydophila pneumonia may have a role both in pathogenesis as well as in uh, acute uh, uh, exacerbations of asthma, and there's something that you should maybe think about. Um, so in asthma pathogenesis, we're thinking about genetic, genes, environment, maybe psychological factors, stress. Um, uh, actually, um, uh, Osler believed that, uh, that asthma was largely a psychological problem, uh, that it was a, a psychiatric, uh, a largely a psychiatric issue. We don't think that today, but clearly stress does play a role in, in exacerbations. I want to want to uh, digress for just a second and talk about something that the older physicians here probably remember. Back in the days when I was a medical student, uh, the uh, here's a quote from Harrison's in 1983, talking about a disease that we uh, uh, still see very frequently, peptic ulcer disease, and uh, the the etiology was unknown, and they were they were looking at a number of different aspects related to peptic ulcer disease. This is what Harrison said. It looked like there's an unfavorable balance between gastric acid peptic secretion and uh, the mucosal resistance to, to acid. So they were looking at all kinds of things, uh, frequencies of blood group antigens, increased uh, secretion of, uh, of uh, digestive enzymes, uh, environmental risk factors such as tobacco smoking and lots of coffee, the type A personality that I can remember my one of my teachers putting up on the board when, uh, when I was a medical student talking about it. And then, of course, Today, we know that, uh, that, that peptic ulcer disease is largely an infection with one organism, uh, usually caused by Helicobacter pylori, for which Nobel Prizes were awarded in 2005. Asthma is not going to turn out to be such a simple uh, disease, uh, certainly, but uh, it does tell you that chronic infections can cause chronic inflammatory processes that, uh, that can cause disease in a small percentage of patients affected. I mean, peptic ulcer disease uh, was difficult to ferret out, but it's a common infection affecting perhaps 50% of the human population, but only a small number of those uh, patients are affected. Genetics are likely to play a role in determining host susceptibility to this organism and how much havoc it can, it can uh, wreak in the uh, intestinal or the, the uh, gastro, uh, gastric mucosa. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the main type of atypical infection that I wanted to focus on today, which is mycoplasma pneumoniae. Uh, it's actually one of about 17 species that have been isolated from humans. Five of them are known to be pathogenic. Mycoplasma pneumoniae, uh, first uh, called Eaton agent, was first thought to be a, a virus because it's so small that it's actually filterable through, through the smallest types of filters that, uh, that really distinguished viruses from bacteria back in the 40s and 50s, then later found to be a, an unusual type of bacteria, very difficult to culture, but we have eventually developed uh, uh, very, very uh, highly enriched culture media so that it can be grown in pure culture. It typically infects uh, ciliated epithelial cells in the upper respiratory tract uh, and oral cavity initially and then, and then moves into the lower respiratory tract frequently, uh, but the infections can be very pleomorphic. Uh, it has to be able to adhere to epithelial cells to cause disease mutations uh, that knock out the civility to adhere, uh, eliminate pathogenic pathogenicity in animal models. It's a very tiny organism, as I mentioned, uh, one of the smallest types of bacteria known, down to about a tenth of a micron. Uh, unlike other bacteria, mycoplasmas don't have any cell wall. And they also are unique in that their plasma membranes contain cholesterol. They have a tiny genome. It's been, it's been stripped down to just the bare essentials, only 677 genes compared to over 4,000 for E. coli. And this is a process that's called reductive evolution, and it is the hallmark 
of an intracellular paras parasite or, or an intracellular bacterium, uh, but uh, an intracellular uh, role for this organism is not well established. What is known, though, is that it's kicked out most of the genes that it needs for normal existence, such as the ability to synthesize purines, uh, most amino acids, and even cholesterol, which it, all, all of which it needs to exist. So it basically is essential, uh, essentially a parasite. It cannot grow on your potato salad or anything like that out in the, uh, out in the world. It has to infect uh, a host organism. Yeah, what thought that just popped into my head? Is this the way that mitochondrial started out? Exactly. I mean, there's there that 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 process, of course, you know, has probably occurred multiple times. Uh, there are lots of uh, another area of intense uh, interest in uh, among microbiologists right now is the finding that a lot of organisms have uh, commensal intracellular organisms that are that are growing within them. Um, al algae, for example, frequently in uh, 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 things like giant clams, they're they're commensal. Uh, organisms that can uh, that are really essential for host uh, the host to uh, uh, survive and mitochondria and chloroplasts uh, presumably uh, eons ago took up such a uh, an existence and and uh, became integral to our cells and essential uh, for our you know very existence uh, these guys are not uh, are not at that point yet they're still troublemakers uh, in general. Uh, but they do appear to have, have reached a point where they're just like the chlamydia, for which this is as well established, who are obligate intracellular parasites. Mycoplasmas may be facultative intracellular pa parasites. Uh, they may have an, an intracellular role uh, or, or an intracellular uh, phase in their existence, and the importance of intracellular infections in, in, in other bacteria as well as uh, the, the mycoplasmas and others, that they may be more resistant to antibi antibiotic treatment in those uh, in those uh, when they're in that particular phase, they may not be replicating. Uh, they may not be very biosynthetically active. Um, we still have a lot to learn to know whether that is true or not. But there is some in vitro data that that shows that mycoplasma money can move into an intracellular uh, um, environment within cells from time to time. Um, Here's what the organism looks like. This was a picture that a graduate student in my lab took uh, some years ago uh, by electron microscopy. It's got this peculiar flask-shaped appearance with an elongated adherent tip uh, that's studded with adhesins. It's like, a, and it's also motile. It crawls around on the plate. Now you can see videos of the organism crawling around, uh, and it needs this adhesive tip to do the crawling as well as the uh, as well as, as well as adherence. And it also uses it. It's also essential for for proper cell division. So it's a specialized little guy. It's got uh, doesn't have a lot of genes, but actually the majority of them we're not sure of the function yet. There are many many uh, of those of those genes that are not the function of which is not clear. Uh, very uh, high. You could think of it as a highly sophisticated organism. So what do the clinical manifestations of these in infections uh, with this organism look like? There. They're actually pretty pleomorphic. The classic in, uh, uh, is a uh, bronchopneumonia, um, but uh, they can also just produce a, a mild upper respiratory uh, uh, set of symptoms during acute infection, or maybe very little symptoms. Family studies, largely done in the 60s and 70s, uh, did not uh, show that uh, if you went to an index, the family of an index case with an atypical pneumonia, Many of the other family members were also infected and might really not have had a lot of symptoms. Uh, the symptoms may be flu-like. They may be accompanied with high fever and chills. Uh, there may be a pharyngitis and some hoarseness, uh, nasal congestion with coryza. Uh, this can progress to wheezing, pleuritic chest pain, and the typical tracheobronchitis or uh, atypical pneumonia. Reinfections are common uh, in, in individuals. Um, it's a very common infection in the U.S. Uh, perhaps 30 percent of uh, community acquired pneumonias, uh, two million infections estimated per year. It tends to occur in little ep epidemics every three to seven years or so for reasons no one's quite sure about. But it is certainly endemic uh, in many areas and infections can occur at any time of the year. Uh, infections occur at all ages, but most of the most more severe infections tend to be older children and, uh, and young adults, young adolescents and young adults. Um, the incubation period, the, the onset of this type of infection is usually rather slow. And 
uh, occur, can occur over two to three weeks of gradually increasing cough. And it's also a rather prolonged infection uh, with cough that can last for weeks. And the organism can actually be cultured from uh, individuals even after antibiotic treatment for months afterwards in many cases. Uh, it's spread by droplets. And studies back in the 60s and 70s in the military showed that people who had their bunk in bunk rooms uh, where an epidemic was occurring, people who had their bunk closest to the shower uh, were most likely to get infected, probably because of the higher humidity in that area. And of course, it does occur in outbreaks uh, and, and little mini epidemics uh, regionally. The radiographic findings uh, often uh, may look more severe than the patient's clinical condition would suggest. Sometimes family members who were more or less asymptomatic without much fever or, or a minimal cough would have an x-ray and actually find uh, a streaky infiltrate. Um, it's frequently uh, sort of a, ba a basilar or bibasilar uh, streaky sort of uh, uh, infiltrate. Uh, there may be pleural effusions uh, that are located uh, or that are uh, unilateral uh, or perhaps even bilateral in a number of, uh, in a significant percentage of cases. Here's a, a series of um, studies that I uh, reviewed over the past 10 years of patients with asthma uh, looking at the occurrence of mycoplasma pneumonia as detected by PCR. And I'll go into why I, I uh, basically uh, restricted this, uh, this to, pay to PCR in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you can see that the, um, the positivity is, uh, they're all less than 50% of these uh, individuals um, <clears throat> that the organism was detected. But there's a very wide range, all the way from a minimal of 4.5% all the way up to almost 50% in one study. So it probably varies. It may vary regionally. Um, and uh, there's also uh, difficulties in, in diagnosis, um, which can uh, depend on the, on the uh, on the particular PCR reaction that's being used, how efficient it is, and so forth, the uh, collection procedures. So point of care diagnosis, it continues to be a big problem with, these, with, uh, with this infection, but it does appear to be capable of, of causing or at least being associated with a, a significant proportion of asthma exacerbations. But most of these studies were done in, in kids, as you can see. The other question that comes up with mycoplasma pneumonia is, what it does, could it have a role in chronic stable asthma? Um, these are two relatively recent uh, studies, or really three, uh, that I thought I would mention. Uh, these are, are uh, uh, have been largely, uh, the most important work have been carried out by Monica Kraft and, and uh, Richard Martin uh, and their colleagues at the University of Colorado. Uh, Dr. Kraft is now at Duke University. But um, uh, the intriguing study that was initially published showed that in chronic uh, adult asthmatics, uh, that if you looked at uh, um, BAL or bronchial, uh, endobronchial biopsies um, by PCR, you could find the organism present there in a substantial proportion, about 50, almost 50 percent of individuals, compared to only a minority of control individuals. And the numbers of controls were, were relatively low. So it's, so it's possible that this is uh, that this may not be real, truly a reflect, reflective of a, of a difference in occurrence, but it certainly does suggest that the organism is there in substantial amounts, at least in, uh, uh, in, uh, in some studies in chronic asthma. Uh, also, several individuals were positive for Chlamydophila pneumonia, uh, another organism that uh, could cause a very similar type of phenotype. And interestingly, <coughs> the same group uh, then did a six-week trial of macrolide treatment uh, in a follow-up study and, de and demonstrated a clinically significant uh, response only in the PCR positive group, about, I think, 0.4 liters uh, in improvement uh, overall in that group. In and importantly, none of these chronic uh, stable asthmatics were serologically positive. They, had, they might have some antibody, but it was not really, since this is a positive, since this is a type of antibody that's present in the normal population, uh, there, were, there was not really a, a difference, uh, a, a significant difference between the, uh, the, the background in these individuals. In a more recent uh, study, a uh, multi-institutional study, this is the study that was used in the, uh, uh, in the earlier paper that I mentioned by Huang et al. Um, 
Sutherland, who's a uh, uh, Rand Sutherland, who's a for, former pulmonary fellow and now uh, I think a faculty member at the uh, University of Colorado, showed that uh, uh, that the organism was still there in substantial numbers, but they were substantially less than the previous study. They were trying to use this um, in 92 <coughs> chronic adult asthmatics, trying to uh, again uh, replicate this finding of uh, improvement with macrolide uh, treatment. They did not get enough positives to be able to show whether this is uh, uh, whether whether macrolides uh, showed efficacy or not. But again, none of these individuals were serologically positive, and the organism was present in a substantial proportion of the of the of the asthmatics. So the question is then, what is it doing there? Does it have a role in pathogenesis, um, along with the other other uh, aspects of uh, of asthma pathogenesis that we've already mentioned? Um, the jury is still out, but it certainly does appear to be there and be capable potentially of causing. Uh, of having a role in pathogenesis and potentially uh, uh, flare periodic flares causing exacerbations of asthma as well. Um, mouse models of asthma uh, using uh, endomony uh, also suggests that this organism is capable of sticking around for a long time. This is uh, a paper by um, uh, Hardy et al. Um, who showed that this this organism could be instilled into uh, mouse airways and could hang around for a long time. This is a pretty old mouse, uh, and they were still able to uh, to culture and PCR the organism in a substantial proportion of animals uh, pretty far out. And if you looked at uh, airway hyperreactivity using whole body plethysmography, there was a strong tendency for the infected animals to have higher baseline uh, 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 airway react uh, uh, wheezing. I guess you could you could call this uh, this uh, uh, enhanced pause that's measured, uh, as well as increased reactivity to methacholine. Risk virulence factors that the organism expresses um, have been a number of different virulence factors have been described that can affect its ability to activate the immune system, cause inflammation, and uh, potentially uh, replicate some of the features of asthma. We know that the organism express it, expresses adhesins on this, uh, on this elongated tip that I showed you earlier, and there are a number of proteins that are involved, particularly a protein called P1 that binds to sialoglycoproteins. Now these uh, sialo sialic acids uh, are uh, decorate uh, uh, most mammalian uh, surface proteins uh, have uh, sialo uh, have uh, sialic acid as part of the carbohydrate uh, molecule uh, carbohydrate portions of surface uh, proteins, and this organism binds rather promiscuously to these uh, sialic acid residues. So it can actually bind to uh, avian uh, tracheal epithelium as well as mammalian mouse human. Uh, although it is not known to cause natural infection outside of humans, and uh, potentially can cause cellular activation by binding to these surface molecules. And I'll show you a little bit of information in a second. Uh, it's been known from the 60s that this organism produces a lot of hydrogen peroxide. So you can, uh, you can let your imagination tell you what would happen if you had a small organism bound to your epithelial cells uh, producing a lot of hydrogen peroxide sort of as a point source. Uh, it can actually cause hemolysis of red cells. And this uh, hydrogen peroxide production has also been shown to be a virulence factor. Uh, mutants which, are, which did not produce hydrogen peroxide have much lower uh, virulence. Uh, it produces lipopeptides, which are capable of, acting, uh, of uh, activating toll-like receptors uh, on macrophages and other immune cells. And the most interesting thing recently uh, is the, uh, the uh, recognition that this organism produces a toxin which is very similar to pertussis toxin and other uh, AB type toxins uh, that has uh, enzymatic activity uh, and has a, a definite toxicity for the uh, respiratory epithelium. And we're still uh, getting more information about this. A lot of this information has been, uh, or virtually all of this information has been, uh, has been uh, produced by one group at the University of Texas in San Antonio with a very senior microbiologist named Joel Baseman 
Um, but uh, the, it, it's certainly very intriguing, and there are a number of recent uh, uh, po um, um, uh, publications that, that suggest that it may have a role in uh, not only in asthma, but other types of respiratory uh, problems, such as ventilator-associated pneumonia. This is a, uh, uh, a ribonuc ribonuclease protection assay showing that, that uh, mycoplasma pneumonia on, on uh, rodent mast cells produces cytokine activation uh, in a very similar way to what's seen with IgE in the first, in the first uh, column. So all these little bands are just the RNA molecules for these different cytokines. So it seems to upregulate uh, uh, cytokine mRNA in mast cells if you uh, used antibodies to, against the P1 adhesin, you could inhibit that process. If you used, uh, if you treated the mast cells with neuraminidase, which removes the sialic acid residues, you also inhibit that process. So the interpretation from this is that the organisms binding to sialoglycoproteins on the surface, likely, uh, some of which would be uh, likely the heavily sialated IgE receptor, and activating them. And this you could think of as just a model for how it might activate a lot of different immunologic cells, and perhaps uh, epithelial cells as well, because it does have this kind of nonspecific capability of binding to sialoglycoproteins on, on cell surfaces. In this, uh, in this last uh, paper uh, published by a postdoc uh, uh, working in my lab, uh, she created uh, trans, uh, our transfected cell lines of this mast cell line in which the uh, alpha chain of the IgE receptor was knocked down using RNAi, and it completely eliminated the response, uh, the uh, production of IL-4 um, protein in uh, secretion. So it looks like in this model that the organism is binding to the IgE receptor and triggering uh, cellular activation through that mechanism. So that's, that's one way the organism could produce activation. I've already mentioned the uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, and lipopeptides, uh, for which there's also experimental evidence showing uh, uh, an important role in pathogenesis, but I wanted to talk just for a, a, a little bit about the uh, about this new toxin, the CARDS toxin, because it's, it's quite interesting. It was first described in 2006 by uh, Cannon and Baseman uh, as an ADP ribosylating and vacuolating cytotoxin, uh, similar to the pertussis toxin, and they've had a number of publications since that time. Most recently, one this earlier this year in Chest uh, uh, by P. J. Peters. Uh, and, uh, and uh, working with Joel Baseman's group. Um, and in this uh, prospective observational study, they looked at 64 um, asthmatics uh, who were, um, um, had fairly uh, refractory asthma. And they looked at uh, nasal lavage uh, fluid and uh, sputum and used PCR and also uh, an antigen capture assay for the CARDS toxin as well as serology. And they found that about 50% of these, of these uh, chronic, uh, rather uh, refractory patients were positive on their initial visit to, um, uh, uh, for the organism uh, compared to other uh, controls. And um, that they, uh, many of them, or, or almost all of them, were, were positive over a very long period of time uh, as they were being monitored. Um, they did find that, that they could detect an antibody to the CARDS toxin itself, an IgM antibody, in the positive patient, but they did not find any difference in IgG titers in these, organ, in these patients from uh, other patients. So it depends on what, it may depend on what uh, antigen you're looking for uh, when you're looking for antibody uh, overall, the antibody, and what type of, what isotype of antibody you're looking for in order to identify these, uh, these uh, types of patients. Uh, or to, to identify patients who have infections. Dr. Atkinson, are there environmental sources of the CARDS toxin that, that aren't necessarily endogenous from the bacteria? Uh, no, as far as I know, this is a specific toxin that's secreted by this by this by this organism. And since I, as I mentioned, this organism is not like aflatoxin, uh, you know, fungal aflatoxins that are made uh, by organisms growing in uh, in uh, contaminated uh, agricultural products. I mean, this organism is pretty much uh, restricted to growing in a eukaryotic host, which, as far as is known, is its natural host. Only natural host is humans. So, as far and and what I'm going to show you now is a couple of other things. Uh, 
uh, which may help to kind of answer that question. Um, intratracheal uh, installation of this, uh, of this toxin, recombinant toxin, can replicate a lot of the effects of uh, infection with the organism in mice and also in a primate model. Um, they found that the, actually the organism doesn't secrete the toxin except in vivo. When you grow it in vitro in this, uh, in this enriched medium, it doesn't seem to produce a lot of the toxin. This is all normalized per M. pneumoniae genome. But it produces a whole lot more of the toxin. So there may be uh, some sort of environmental cues that the organism gets when it's growing on an epithelial surface in an, in an animal uh, that, uh, that triggers the production of this toxin. We're still trying to understand that. Um, this organism doesn't have a lot of uh, well-understood uh, gene regulation, and so it's, it's still not clear exactly what is triggering this difference in toxin production. But uh, there does appear to be upregulated uh, toxin secretion when it's, when it's present uh, on, an, on an actual epithelial surface. This is a picture of what the mouse uh, um, uh, bronchial epithelium looks like with heat inactivated toxin on the left and after uh, installation of 44 picomoles of toxin on the right side. You can see tremendous vacuolization of the, of the epithelia there, and, uh, and also as well as a, as a lymphocytic infiltrate, uh, largely lymphocytic infiltrate uh, in the surrounding uh, um, lung parenchyma. And this is uh, uh, also in the same paper, uh, well, in a, in a recent publication by the same group, they used normal human bronchial epithelial cells grown in air-liquid interface cultures. This is a really sophisticated culture technique for these cells. And these cells are now are stained here uh, with, uh, with three different stains. DAPI, which stains DNA. Aloidin, which I think is a stain for um, um, uh, actin. An antibody to the, an to the toxin itself in red. And then the last one is all three merged. And the most interesting, uh, uh, actually, part of this to me, if you look at the, uh, at the bottom where they're actually looking at, at slices uh, as seen from the side, you can see the little organisms along the, surface of, along the cell surface here in blue on the left side. Um, and then uh, you can see the organism, you can see, you can see the toxin also clustered on the, on the surface, but you can also see it within the cell. Um, and this is uh, then uh, seen uh, again in the merged uh, um, uh, picture and they have actually a lot. Uh, they have other uh, publications showing that this toxin is entering the cell and presumably uh, because of its enzymatic activity, it's modifying substrates uh, in within the cell and altering cellular functions. Exactly what it's what it's ribosylating and what functions it's active. It's uh, it's uh, uh, interfering with or modifying uh, have yet to be figured out. So um, I wanted to talk for a second about the diagnosis of M. pneumonia infections in your asthmatic patients who are in the hospital, sick, uh, with a, maybe an oxygen requirement, not doing so well. How would you want, how would you want to look at them to try to figure out if, uh, if they might have a concurrent uh, M. pneumonia infection and, and whether treatment might be uh, indicated? As I'll show in just a little bit, you can't just uh, throw a macrolide uh, in, into the mix and assume that the patient is being adequately treated anymore. Um, but I will say that serology is, is it's not uh, clearly uh, reliable for point of care use. As I've, as I've shown before, a lot of the studies are showing that the organism may be there uh, and there may not be positive antibodies. Um, that, this is more the case in patients with chronic infections probably than someone who's got an acute uh, bronchopneumonia. Probably someone who's got a real hot bronchopneumonia with fever is going to have antibody uh, that's, going to that's going to develop in the, in the, in the usual uh, time course. But it does take time to develop antibodies, uh, particularly IgG antibodies. You may have IgM antibodies within two or three days, but IgG antibodies are going to take a little longer to develop, and you may not have the uh, luxury of that much time. Culture is really out of the question. It can take up to six weeks it's rather insensitive. You have to get you have to get viable organisms. They have to be transported to the lab, and they have to be cultured. And, and even with all optimal conditions, it can take up to six weeks. So for point of care purposes, it's pretty useless. PCR has a lot of attractions. Um, so 
Uh, here's just a little note on culture. The, these are the culture. These are what they look like under the microscope. The organism grows so so slowly that actually to count the to look at the to look for it growing in culture, you actually have to look under a microscope at the plates uh, uh, before you can see them in most cases. Um, as I mentioned, it's pretty insensitive, but it is the only way to perform formal antibiotic sensitivity testing. We do know some genetic changes that are present in the organism uh, that can tell you that it's resistant to macrolides, but for example, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance is potentially possible, and tetracycline resistance, uh, which is occurring in other species of macrolides, hasn't been seen naturally in, in, uh, uh, in pneumonia yet that I know of, but um, it's theoretically possible, and the only way you'll probably pick it up, the only way you could practically speaking that you could pick it up would be to would be to do culture and sensitivity testing, which can really only be done in a small number of of, um, of centers. So uh, this is a little study that we published uh, uh, a couple of years ago, showing that uh, in these chronic uh, stable asthmatic children, um, some of whom actually had acute uh, infections at the time they were they were sampled. Um, PCR positivity in the majority of cases, both in the controls and in the asthmatics, uh, was not associated with any detectable antibody that was outside the range of the normal pooled uh, serum that we were using for our, uh, for, our, for our positive control. So they may not have a lot of antibody, at least, uh, at least uh, you can't really count on it. Um, everyone knows that PCR is a very sensitive technique. It's theoretically capable of, of picking up uh, one genome uh, of M. pneumoniae uh, in, in an aliquot that's used in the, uh, uh, in the PCR reaction. You can detect it in asymptomatic people uh, who aren't necessarily, uh, uh, who, don't, who don't necessarily have a lot of inflammatory responses. Uh, it doesn't require viable organisms. Um, it will be positive when the organisms are present before the serological response can occur. It's pretty rapid. Um, you only need one specimen. You don't need acute and convalescent samples. The disadvantages are well known. It's, uh, it's very susceptible to contamination. The labs have to be rigorously run with rigorous controls, but these are problems that can be overcome, and you can't do traditional antibiotic susceptibility testing with it. However, we do know that, that uh, M. pneumonia is becoming resistant to macrolides, um, and uh, it only takes one mutation in the 23S ribosomal RNA uh, gene to uh, uh, one base change can uh, produce essentially complete uh, resistance to macrolides. Um, this is now widespread in Asia. We know it's occurring in the U.S. and Europe, but its current real prevalence in the West is really unknown, probably varies from region to region. We think this is going to become a real therapeutic problem in the not-too-distant future, particularly when you're thinking about treating young children. So these are some recent papers. Uh, 90 of 100 isolates obtained in Shanghai, and we have uh, their published papers also showing a very similar uh, rate in Beijing uh, in uh, mycoplasma pneumonia were resistant, high grade and resistance to, uh, to macrolides. Uh, it's occurring in Italy at a substantial proportion in France, and this is a paper uh, from uh, uh, 2008 uh, uh, from the CDC in which they were looking at an encephalitis outbreak in Rhode Island that was associated with a mycoplasma pneumonia uh, outbreak, and that's an entirely different aspect. Some of the extra pulmonary uh, aspects of acute mycoplasma pneumonia infection are, are also pretty significant. But they found uh, almost a third of the isolates were macrolide resistant. So we know it's here in the U.S. Um, it may be, uh, it may be a, uh, a bigger problem soon because macrolides are very frequently used. And we know that, the, that actually that macrolide resistance can occur even during treatment in the same patient. Um, that's, been, that's been documented in the past. Um, it does appear that macrolide resistant, um, the patients with infections with macrolide resistant uh, uh, M. pneumonia uh, are a little sicker, although this is hard to tell. Many of the patients, uh, as I mentioned, don't have a lot of symptoms. Uh, they may not be very sick. Uh, it's got a very wide range of, uh, of uh, severity, so these types of studies are really hard to do with this, uh, but it does appear that, that, that they stay sicker longer, um, they don't respond to the treatment, uh, and so they tend to have a more prolonged illness, and that patients who have macrolide-resistant pneumonia 
uh, tend to have to have antibiotic substitutions because they're not responding to therapy. Um, so here are the four types of antibiotics that you could think about using for an M. pneumonia infection. And for the pediatricians in the group, uh, you could probably answer this question pretty easily. Which antibiotic would you be comfortable with using in your child who's less than eight years of age? It's really only macrolides. Yeah. So what's going to happen if we reach uh, the 90% or 95% macrolide resistance that we're seeing in China now? in the U.S. in the next 10 years, we're going to have an untreatable reservoir of young patients who may serve as a source of infection for grandma or their older siblings and so forth. Um, so far, tetracycline and fluoroquinolone resistance has not really been seen uh, to occur naturally, but it's, uh, it does occur in other, uh, in other organisms and has been induced in laboratory strains. So it's conceivable that those could be a problem also, but these are not drugs that anybody would feel comfortable with using uh, as at least as a first choice in someone uh, in a young child. Um, we published a paper recently showing uh, two patients, only one of these had potentially had had some wheezing in the past, so these are not really asthmatics, but they were two children who were hospitalized with pretty severe lower respiratory infection. Uh, they were poorly responsive to azithromycin and then were subsequently found to have antibiotic resistant uh, M. pneumonia which had the same mutation. Uh, so these are, it is occurring, uh, and uh, the, uh, we're expecting that this, that this rate is going to increase. Oops. You closed our window. <laughs> uh, okay. How do I open it again? Let's see. Up uh, oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to advance one? I'm trying to advance one. I'm not having a lot of luck here. Let me do it for you. Okay. Uh, this is just a picture of the PCR uh, reaction showing that the, uh, it's very easy to tell uh, actually with the, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the macrolide resistance strains that have been, mutations that have been identified, they have different melting temperatures. This is the temperature, so the PCR product uh, melts at a, different, at a different temperature. So it's pretty easy to tell if you're dealing with a macrolide resistance strain. You can do that with PCR. Uh, if you're not going to be able to detect unknown reaction, uh, unknown uh, resistant mutations, but you can look for the ones that are known, and there are only uh, three or four really that are known at this time. Uh, we had, uh, and I'm, I'm about out of time here, so I, I know I need to finish up. We did have a patient recently in a, uh, who was a uh, transplant patient on multiple uh, immunosuppressive medications who was hospitalized with an extremely severe respiratory infection who had turned out to have co-infection with H1N1 and a macrolide-resistant M. pneumonia. And it was only after he got started on a fluoroquinolone that he turned around. He nearly wound up on a ventilator, and he did go home on oxygen. He had a very severe prolonged respiratory infection. So this, uh, to close, um, the uh, take-home points uh, that I would uh, suggest that you think about, at least for your asthmatics. Um, well, first of all, uh, I didn't mention, but in the first uh, couple, of, the first few slides, uh, the, the developing data to, that's going to be very interesting, and I suspect there's going to be a lot of new and very interesting findings in the next several years, looking at the microbiome of patients with chronic respiratory diseases, particularly asthma and COPD, that are going to show, are likely to show, big differences in the microbiome and between those patients and, and normals. Now, what the actual meaning of that, those differences are, is another question that may take a long time to sort out. Um, but uh, mycoplasma pneumonia prevalence does appear to be increased in patients with asthma, at least in some studies. Uh, it, it's certainly fairly common in the population. We can certainly say that. Acute diagnosis uh, of active my, mycoplasma pneumonia infection at, at present is best done using PCR and respiratory secretions. Uh, sputum is probably better than anything, but uh, nasopharyngeal swabs or, or throat swabs uh, are also adequate. And uh, macrolide resistance is emerging in the U.S. It's here. Uh, we don't know what the frequency is. It's probably reason, uh, fairly low right now, maybe 10, 20, uh, or possibly 30 percent in some areas. But it may become a worse. Uh, it may become uh, a, a more severe problem as uh, as the years as, oh, over the next decade or so. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, it can occur even with treatment of the same patient. So you might keep that in mind uh, for your for your hospitalized patients. And I think that's my last slide. If I have any uh, questions, I'll be glad to be glad to answer them if we have time. Okay,
So do I, cause what do you recommend? Because it's not something we typically address with uh, our asthma patients, like you know their mycoplasma status. Even even if they're severe or admitted to the hospital, it's not something we typically screen for or treat. But what's your recommendation as far as what to do when you know? Do we screen everyone with asthma, or do you do just the, you know acutely ill patients in the hospital, or how do you recommend we we take that information? Um, so, uh, it, it kind of depends on the severe illness, I, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly if the patient has any fever, we start thinking uh, more about, in fact, um, you know, uh, if the patient uh, has an oxygen requirement, if the patient has I would look for, I would try to look for any, uh, the, the possibility that there might be uh, a respiratory infection that's uh, that's triggering the patient's illness, and uh, PCR on sputum or or a throat swab or a nasopharyngeal swab for mycoplasma pneumonia, as well as respiratory viruses, would be um, would be something that uh, that uh, you could uh, could think about doing if you have that available at your institution. I'm expecting, or everybody in the microbiology uh, 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 area is expecting and hoping that better uh, point of care uh, uh, molecular diagnostic techniques are going to become available in the next in the next decade. We're not there yet by any means. It's still pretty arduous, uh, but um, most large centers have, uh, where or at least where our training programs are located, do have the facility to do those types of things. And if uh, your microbiology department doesn't offer uh, a uh, um, a PCR, uh, those specimens can be shipped overnight to another center where they can be done pretty expeditiously. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite possible to do these within 24 hours if you if you really lean on the on the lab. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. I assume the sample you need is like sputum. You don't, any, you don't have any to be type of everybody to get it, do you? Any type of no, yeah, any type of respiratory secretions. If you're really talking about an acute exacerbation, the organism should be there. So yeah. um, I, I would, you know, you you may not find it in the in the oropharynx as readily, but I don't know that anybody can really tell you. But certainly if it's not detectable in sputum, uh, you would, uh, you'd argue that it's probably not, not a real, it might be there, but it's certainly not there in, in quantity. Um, yeah. You know, you've got my mind spinning with all of these new ideas, and I'm particularly intrigued about this heart Toxin, you know, if we can't kill the bacteria with macrolides, any possibility of making a toxoid and immunizing to the card toxin and, and using that as a treatment, sort of the way we do with tetanus toxin? It, you're talking about vaccines, and I, I really think that that is, the, that is the future for this organism. It's mm -hmm. such a common infection. Um, there, had, there were some abortive attempts, uh, well, actually some pretty large attempts back in the 60s and 70s to develop vaccines. Those were done with whole organism. Whole organism. Now we're in the in the uh, age of subunit vaccines, and uh, this would be, certainly be that. And the P1 uh, protein would be uh, certainly uh, very good targets for uh, a vaccine. And I, I agree completely. I think that would be uh, those would be things that would be potentially very useful. It, it does appear that asthmatics, in particular, don't seem to make humoral antibody responses as well. And I, I didn't mentioned this, but in the little paper that we published a, a couple of years ago um, uh, in asthma proceedings, uh, in uh, allergy proceedings, the, uh, the one significant thing that, uh, that popped out from our, uh, our studies was that the asthmatics didn't make, uh, that uh, we found a lot more IgG, elevated IgG to pneumonia among the controls than we did in the, among the asthmatics. So there may be kind of a blunted uh, uh, response to the organism among the asthmatics, and a, a vaccine might be something that might be able to, to boost their response and allow them to, to at least uh, control the infection better. Yeah, especially now that we have adjuvants that we can use to enhance immune responses and, and so on. Exactly. Chris, Chris, this is Paul. I have a, a question if you have some time still. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I had actually heard Dr. Martin speak at, at the Aspen conference back in, I think it must have been 2002, because it was pretty fresh information at the time. Um, and um, he talked about a number of these patients that had severe asthma, and he was dealing with adults who um, basically were on every medicine at that point, known to man, this is before Zolaire, and um, just weren't getting better. And um, 
and he talks about doing PCR and, and thinking about mycoplasma and these people having chronic infections. Based on that study that you mentioned, they you know they showed that in that group of patients, and he was telling that he was kind of doing it almost routinely at that point, um, that they were putting them on um, uh, azithromycin um, uh, as almost like a controller medicine with a with a daily dose sort of stuff. That um, I think he initially treated them for the infection, then he came kept them on like a maintenance dose, um, and was able at least at the ASPA conference showed data that. A lot of these patients were able to come off their inhaled, lower their dose or inhaled steroids, get rid of some of the other medicines they were on, and had a better quality of life. Um, and I remember at the time having some bad asthmatics that were teenagers here that we that we kind of tried the same thing and they actually got better. My thought was that part of it was because of the macrolide, sort of like the old tail uh, medrol uh, phenomena, where we used to think that the macrolides had some anti-inflammatory effect. Um, do you think there's any role uh, for some of these um, um, severe asthmatics that um, just aren't responding to anything that may have a chronic, um, you know, mycoplasma infection? That that having them on low dose, um, you know, antibiotic may be of some help even for a period of time to kind of get them over the hump. Well, um, that is that is a really interesting subject, and uh, that was the purpose of this uh, Sutherland uh, study that uh, came out. That unfortunately didn't have a. Uh, that I think the the one finding that they had was that uh, symptomatically macrolides improve overall. There was a there was a significant, uh, relatively mild but but significant increase in uh, in symptoms. Although they they couldn't prove they didn't have the numbers of uh, M. pneumoniae positive. Uh, Individuals, but if you look at some of the graphs, I didn't say this, but uh, there's a pretty interesting-looking trends among among the, uh, the the graphs in that paper uh, related to the pneumonia-positive individuals that were treated. Uh, but at any rate, um, yeah, that, I mean, there there's at least three uh, uh, randomized controlled trials in cystic fibrosis with azithromycin. You, you're probably aware that a lot of uh, the, the more severe cystic fibrosis patients are being treated with prophylactic azithromycin and. Uh, and it clearly works in a in a subgroup of patients with cystic fibrosis to stabilize or maybe even improve their airway uh, uh, function. Now we know cystic fibrosis is a is a disease where microbial uh, uh, that that's that in which uh, microbial infection is a is a big player. There's not really any data that M. pneumonia has anything to do with it. And the the party line I think among pulmonologists uh, that that they uh, are, are uh, assuming that this, res that this response in these, in these individuals is, is due to an more to anti-inflammatory effects, which are clearly there in the macrolides. They do have anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, my question would be, well, if they're anti-inflammatory, then why doesn't everybody respond? If it's, if it's, why is it a subgroup that's responding? But um, uh, I, I can say that um, having talked to uh, Dr. Martin, I was actually uh, on. Uh, I was uh, involved in a program project with him on this on this topic. He actually got interested in this topic because he had a patient who had been sent to them with with highly uh, refractory asthma, and they uh, they did uh, bronchial they did uh, EM EM on uh, on uh, bronchial epithelial cells and saw the mycoplasma on the uh, on the epithelial surface. And they put the patient on clarithromycin, and the patient uh, got got in, uh, dramatically better. And so, and and then it turned out that every time they took the patient off the clarithromycin, he got worse again. So he stayed on clarithromycin at least for a decade. Um, so it might be worth a try if you have a, a problem patient who's really not doing well, and he's on everything, and you can't seem to get any better. I s would certainly think that. Uh, a trial, on a prolonged trial of macrolide, and maybe then uh, macrolide uh, prophylaxis with macrolides might be might be worth a try. And it's problem. My guess is that just like everything else with humans, it's it's probably not going to work for everybody, but it might it might work. Um, you could try diagnostic studies, you know, looking to try to see whether the organism is there. Uh, you know, if you uh, a lot of these patients are really not suitable for. Um, bronchial alveolar lavage or, or things like that, but if you can get a sputum sample or something like that, you can try to see if there's any signs of PCR positivity and that sort of thing. But even if it were there, you know, proving causality is another problem, is another issue. There's clearly a lot of bacteria, or there, there appear to be a lot of bacteria in the airways in these types of patients, and, uh, and uh, proving causality is always going to be the, the big issue. 
Yeah. Well, a lot, lot to learn. It sounds like a very exciting field, and we're hoping that you'll come back maybe next year and update us on uh, what you're finding out. No, I appreciate anyway. the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. A uh, Prescott Atkinson for his review of atypical infections and asthma. That's all the time we have now. Um, we're going to, uh, to stop at this point. This has been Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, join us next week uh, for our continuation of our immunology series. We'll also uh, meet with Dr. John Lantos on ethics and pediatrics. In the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.